back. It's our very first episode. Hold on. Hold on. I talked about this before we started the podcast. For anyone listening, that's a beer opening. Oh Go on, Calvin. Oh, my God. All right, Zach. It's our very first episode. Man, this is this has been in the works for like a couple months now, right? Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, so my name is Zachary Smith. Um, I'm a good friend of Calvin. We've, we'll talk about where we came from in a, probably either this episode or some future episodes. And Calvin, why don't you go ahead as well? <laughs> sure, yeah. So I'm Calvin. Um, I'm a broke grad student. We'll start with that. <laughs> oh, we're including that into it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Why not? <laughs> so I'm a very successful uh, chemical engineer. And meanwhile, Calvin is still in his PhD. Yeah. Well, close so, to, I think. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into more details later, right? The thing is, like, this is our first episode. So why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, this project in the making. So... You know, what, what are your thoughts on this idea? Why did we want to do this? Well, I, I think maybe we should, I'll start off with the, you ask, you tell me first, because I know um, you were a little more enthusiastic about this, and then I'll give you what my thoughts are. I think our thoughts might be a little bit different about what we want this to be. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so, I mean, the thing is, uh, Zach and I have been good friends for a while, and we've uh, kind of went through some difficulties together. So you know how... Sometimes you kind of feel like, wow, I, I need an adult. Or like, I want to ask someone for help. But like, there really isn't anyone there. So you just kind of find a friend and talk to them and kind of figure it out. So Zach and I started just meeting up, having some fried chicken, uh, trying to give some advice, mostly going on tangents. Popeye but, uh, specifically, not sponsored. <laughs> oh, boy. But yeah, so we were thinking of maybe trying to bring that to others, right? Because it's something that maybe someone else listening in might be able to, you know, get a little benefit from too. So. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I mean, what I think the podcast is, is like, I think, yes, most of that's true. I think, you know, anyone can look to the podcast and get some, whatever information you can. That's pretty much what podcasts are for. But I also want to be, you know, a lot more relaxed. I wanted to just be us sharing our thoughts like we usually do. And we think that they're interesting enough to be splouted on the internet. So, you know, maybe we can, hopefully everyone else finds it just as useful as we do when we have our talk. And I think that's the best thing. I think like, you know, a lot of the best podcasts around there are, just you talk to someone who's interesting, who has interesting ideas and an interesting thought pattern, and you want to share that more with everyone else. So I think this is our idea of where it's just going to be me and Calvin first. And then I know we talked about having guests on at a later date, and I'm sure that will come to it. We'll bring some more interesting people. Hopefully they're interesting. And uh, and just see where, see where everything goes. I think right now for the, probably the first, I think like what, I want to say first single-digit episode is going to be me and him. And then maybe after that we'll see if bringing in more people, but that's going to be further down the line. But yeah, I think it's just going to be a chill talking session, talking about stuff we care about, stuff that we think are interesting. But yeah, so um, as for the podcast, um, if anyone does have any comments about it, sure, we'll, we'll try and listen to it. But also remember, we're, this is our first one. If we get two views, I'm going to be ecstatic. <laughs> Oh, boy. Yeah, I know. Let's see how it goes. So here, Calvin, you had a whole, uh, I think you're the one directing this episode, so you go ahead first. <laughs> yeah, sure. So the thing is, like, uh, the big thing that I wanted to focus on was uh, a little bit of, you know, trying to recapture that bit of, you know, ask a friend how things are going and kind of kind of seeing if there's something you can get out of it. But, uh, you know, the big thing about that is, what if you give bad advice? You know, I'm sure we've all had that one friend where you kind of go like, hey, what should I do about this? And they just don't exactly help very much. So wh what do you think about giving bad advice, right? Because I'm, I'm worried that someone might listen in and think, oh, we know everything because her, her we're educated, but uh, maybe not. Um, I don't care much of if I give bad advice. The, the main reason why, and like, you know, as much as that sounds like a, oh, you don't care about telling people that they're going to do something wrong, like, no. It's more about that uh, I don't, if that was always the case where I always had to think about I'm going to do something wrong, then that would limit so many things that I would usually do. And one of that is entails giving advice, right? Like, you know, all I'm doing is just giving my perspective on the scenario. It's up to the person receiving that to decide, hey, I'm going to take that with a grain of salt. I'm going to say, oh, that's really good. Maybe I should apply that. Or it's like, nope, they are completely out of the water. They are so far out left field that that does not make sense. And as we're giving that sort of bad, yeah, really, it's just like, it's not like it's going to be an issue with, um, yeah, it's not, it's, I would say it's not, it's not an issue with giving bad advice. It's more like, are you scared of doing something wrong? 
that's the way I see of it. That's the problem that I, I would see of when you when you say like, oh, are you okay? Are you scared of giving bad advice? Like, no, because it's entirely up to the person receiving that advice what they want to say. Like, if someone tells me that investing into Bitcoin is their advice, is their advice, and they think it's good advice, I can, st- you know, m- is it good? Maybe, maybe not. Right? So it's a very risky game, but I'm going to take that with whatever understanding that I have. Some people think that's great advice. Some people think it's bad advice. Same thing with saying investing into real estate is always a good advice. That's from their perspective. And from your own, per- from the person receiving that advice, it's a question of, okay, is it actually worthwhile or not? I really don't think I'm afraid of it. It's just more like, I'm going to give the advice appropriate to the question. And I'm going to, and then I always, pref- I always preface it and end it with, this is my own experience. You do what, we, what you want with it. And if you come back to me and say that that was bad advice, I'm going to say, well, listen, I told you what my, the context to it was, and you still ran with it. So that's still your own decision that you made. Own up to it and, de- and deal with it in your own time. Oh, my God. You chose the wrong profession, man. I should have been a lawyer. I'll have to disclaim this. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the thing is, like, I – so let, let's start with story time. I've had a friend who um, quite a while ago – asked me why I always seem so knowledgeable about things. And, like, the thing is, I'm not. Or I'm going to put that out there right now, right? Both of us are no educated. <laughs> Both of us are educated, right? We went to school, and we'll talk more about school another time. That still doesn't also mean anything, but yes, go on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the thing is, like, he always said, you seem so knowledgeable about things. And it's not that I'm knowledgeable. It's just that I'm pretty okay with giving an opinion, right? I feel like everyone should or at least can have an opinion on pretty much anything like everyone's had some experience in one way or another about stuff right you may not be like an astrophysicist so you may not have like the strongest opinion on like space and stuff like that but you you in your everyday life have heard about things or have seen something so you should have like some opinion on something and sharing that opinion uh is something that i think is important Right, because uh, that other friend, he he was wondering, like, well, aren't you worried about you know saying something that's wrong, spreading misinformation? It's like, well, again, it's just you know, to the best of my knowledge, it's this. In my opinion, it's that. And having this conversation, this this like back and forth a little bit about whatever is kind of important, you know. And that's that's a, again why I kind of want to start this, you know, kind of get this conversation going about this. Yeah, I mean, like. Everyone has an opinion about something. It's just whether or not that opinion is somewhat valid by their own personal experience. Not like I can have an opinion about a law, or I have an opinion about a certain industry or subject. But this is like from a very overview, um, look, looking from the outside in perspective. And then you got to take it with that idea in mind. Whereas if say for uh, maybe an example would be, um, let's say I have a concern about how laws are made. Right. This is from me not being in any sort of law field, not being in a courtroom for I don't even know if I have ever been in a courtroom, if I remember correctly. And then so I'll have a very different opinion than a person who is a lawyer, a person who works in that sort of area like every single day or, you know, even at least once a week to some extent. So having that, uh, having someone say you're so knowledgeable about something, it's not you're knowledgeable, it's just you have an opinion on it because you've actually experienced it. Like if someone asked me, what do I think about the hunting happening in Northern Ontario of some of the bears that are going on? I was like, I don't know. I don't live there. I mean, do I think, and then they ask, well, is it good or bad? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what the context is. I don't know why they're being hunted. I don't know who's doing the hunting. I don't know if it's like because they're overpopulation or not, right? Like it's, it's all with a sort of context of who's speaking it. And it's also why I'm going to go on a little side note here is like, you know, it's why I think a lot of celebrities need to shut the hell up <laughs> on social media, <laughs> especially if they're not involved with it. Um, some people, you know, it, fine, you want to listen to your takes, great. But I think people shouldn't put their takes, their hot takes, on a pedestal <laughs> to some extent because they're not in that field. Sure, they probably talk with someone for a movie role or whatever the case is, but it's like, it's not like we should accept when um, Gal Gadot said something about, I think, when the COVID thing happened, um, she s- took a certain take on it. It's like, does her opinion invalidate what others are? No, that's just her opinion. Take it with a grain of salt. So it doesn't mean it's fact, and it doesn't mean like you should point to that person as a reference, saying she said that. So I'm going to believe that because she wouldn't lie to me. It's like no, take it from who you say it, from who you hear it from. That's all I have to. Oh boy, to yeah. Say that. yeah. Oh man, that's that's an uh, interesting stance to take. I guess I don't know. Maybe maybe not interesting. Like the thing is, like I I feel like critical thinking may be the the one thing that we're trying to hit at, right? Not a lot of people have that, and and you know I'm guilty of it as well. Because um, 
I've had the I've had the times where I, it's you know whether in the workplace or outside the workplace, I wanna I choose whether or not I wanna put more thought into it than needs to be, and so that's where that critical thinking comes in. Like, how much thought do you put into something that it becomes worthwhile to put? You know, the whole diminishing returns idea, where if I put more work and more thought into this idea and process, will it give me the same amount of returns whereas if I just put the minimum amount of effort? And depending on the situation, it doesn't. That's why some people like, um, do you know, just like reading an article, reading it at face value and not thinking into it. And some people like to say, okay, well, let me delve more into this and do more research and look more and more into it. Sorry, excuse me, that was a burp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my like I said, God. It's going to be a good morning. Oh, yeah. So... Um, I think a lot of people don't like that. It's it comes with the whole idea of I want everything fast and easy and quick, and I want it. I just want to hear someone give me the answer and just put that into a report, a paper, a spreadsheet, and just be done with it, because everyone seems to be so busy. And so a lot of that critical thinking goes away, as well as like you know whether you want to whether you want to go into the whole school topics about whether or not school actually enforces critical thinking or enforces memorization. Okay, okay, well, let's dig into that a little bit, actually, because I wanted to talk about that at some point, but I guess we're going to talk about it now. So what do you think about English class? We're going to start on tangents already. What do you think about oh, English wow. class, we're Zach? I think, oh, yeah. So to so, uh, give everyone context, we have a little doc on the side that has all of our ideas, and I think this was, like, way further down the line, but I guess we're going to talk about it right now. Um, what do I think about English class? Well, I'm an engineer, so I'm, that's my context, and my actual opinion is... I think, it's, I think it's somewhat useful. I mean, I think my vocabulary can be a lot better. I think my writing can be definitely be a lot better. And that was also my worst subject, which is why I'm an engineer now. Um, I think it's an okay, I think it's like a good enough subject. I think everyone should at least, you know, if we we're talking about core fundamental um, courses that need to be taken throughout both elementary school and high school, it's what? English, math, science. Um, I went from, I came from a Catholic school, so we religion was also mandatory all throughout. And I'm trying to think of one other one. Um, I guess phys ed only happens to like grade 10, I believe. And then I'm trying to think of other mandatory ones. Was there any other mandatory ones besides those three? Well, we had to take French for a little while. French is, okay, so, yeah, so give everyone an idea. We're from we're, Canada. We're, we're from Canadian. the great white north. <laughs> um, in Canada, especially, and I'll say specifically here, in on, we're from the province of Ontario. Um, Ontario requires that all uh, people in both elementary school and, uh, and elementary school take a French class, because since French is technically Canada's second, uh, is it second? Oh, it's part it's of their... Our, it's our second, uh, like, main language. It's yeah, an second. official language. Yeah. Like, you're, you're supposed to have everything available in both English and French, but that, that varies a little bit depending on where you actually are. Exactly. So in elementary school, we are all taught French, I think, from grade f three or four to Something eight. Like that, yeah. And then in high school, you can take it's mandatory in grade nine, and then um, after that, and to give everyone an idea, grade nine is like the freshman year, because uh, I know there's some places yeah. that don't go by grades and such. Um, grade nine is when you take French, and after that, it's all optional. And the idea is that's supposed to be enough. Now, I, in my personal experience, um, in my personal life, I went from a Toronto school to a uh, school in my hometown, and. We, and I didn't realize it, but in Toronto, apparently, they teach you French and Spanish in kindergarten, and that's where they start off with. They do? I didn't have that. I, <laughs> downtown Toronto, man, I was, um, I don't know how far, probably like at least 20 minutes away from here, where we are oh, right wow. now. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I'll tell you the life story anyway. Um, and so when I went in, and then when I transferred schools, um, they, I went, in, I went to my new school, and I and I was like, oh, okay, we're doing French. And then I realized everyone was like, a, I think I remember everyone was like, like a base level. And I was just like speaking things like no problem. I was looking at everyone like, guys, this is, we should have learned this stuff already. And that's when it, when it kicked in that that school didn't actually start French until grade four, which I think is also a bit of a mistake. Because I think um, the sooner you start a second language, which is what I kind of regret a little bit, is when, is when you learn it the best. And that's why French immersion schools, in case everyone know, anyone doesn't know what a French immersion school is, French immersion is basically you speak French, I think, for, like, what, half the time? So, that you're in, so in I area? actually uh, applied to a French immersion school, but my parents pulled me out because they just didn't like the other subjects there. Mm -hmm. But basically, French immersion is, you know how, like, if you're in, like, a primarily English-speaking location, right? So let, let, let's say, like, um, Toronto is primarily English-speaking. 
uh, then you, when you go to school, your teachers are, for like all your subjects, speaking English, right? You will learn science, you will learn math or whatever, but they will be speaking English. Uh, immersion, French immersion, is they will teach those other courses in that other language. So for French immersion, I would be learning like in grade like six or whatever, I, I would be learning like uh, basic like patterns and like stuff like that in French, right? So the idea is that you are immersed in the language, hence the name, and so you are forced to learn it. There is no only like dedicated classroom time for it. It is all day, mm -hmm. right? And we've had a few friends who've actually done French immersion and their French is okay now actually. They're a lot better than mine because like by context, I, I took French all throughout um, high school. So I, I took it all the way till I was like 18, 19 or something like that. Uh, and I even got this little like certificate from the government saying, hey, congrats, you know, you can speak some French. And I'm like, well, not that much anymore. Because <laughs> like all, all the French that I had was like in that class. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's like the second you get out of that sort of um, area, that zone of like, oh, uh, this is where I speak French and this is where I also speak English. The second you get rid of one of those things, it just completely diminishes your ability to speak it. Yeah, it, go yeah. it goes away. Exactly. But okay, so I'll go back to your original question about the English one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a good, I think it's a good, enough, uh, good enough subject. I mean, it's core. I think everyone needs to at least speak it a little bit. And I... You know, part of me. Yes, everyone should speak English. You <laughs> yes. heard it here first. <laughs> Listen, you, you meet some people and then you're wondering, like, man, like, how do they even talk? <laughs> how do they even, where do they even learn some places, right? Um, and then some people who are really good at it. And I think that's the one thing that I think gets, I know English is always supposed to be core for everyone. Everyone's like, why do we have to take an English course? I don't know how to speak English. It's not about speaking it, okay? It's about understanding it. It's about understanding different stories in that sort of language because when you tell a story in one language, you tell a story in a different language, sometimes it can have two completely different contexts. Um, and on that side note, I also, you know, part of me, if I was in high school and I was in elementary school, I would have, as a kid, I would have said, I hate French. I don't want to do this anymore. I know how to speak. I know I only, I'm only going to speak English. Why am I learning this? And now older me is like, eh, I kind of wish I learned it a little better, a little bit more. I just kind of wish they, um, as I said, they started it at an earlier age for French. Same thing they do with English. Like, you know how they can do in kindergarten, they you do all the word test, you do, like, stuff like that? Just do the same thing for French. Like, I mean, we have, you know, I'm going to talk about our na national stuff later. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so that's what I think about English class. Calvin, what do you think about English class? Since you're the one who brought up this question. So here's the thing, right? Like, English class, to me, was uh, honestly, like, a good experience. And I mean, I think it really is, like, well, for most subjects, is this way. But I mean, it depends on who teaches it, right? Because the way that I learned English and how to like uh, frame things and like understand stories and stuff uh, is purely from my English classes, which is like something that not everyone I've talked to kind of kind of gets, right? So like I, I mean, there's all these like memes and stuff on the internet as well about how you know if the curtain's blue, what does it mean? Like, well, sometimes the curtain's just blue, you know. But uh, for me, like I I got English taught by someone who, just like me, wanted to be a novelist. And so English class to me is like watching a movie and then talking about what you liked about that movie. And I think that's a skill that like everyone just kind of naturally gets just from watching a lot of movies, right? But when you change the context a little bit, now you read like a book or like a chapter of a book or something, and now you're, you're now trying to like describe it. All of these English teachers are like, well, what does this symbolism of this like curtain or whatever? And that's not exactly like all English has to offer. And that's unfortunately what a lot of them teach, right? So for me, right, like if I said, I like this character because they are funny, right? They have good comedic moments, right? That is just as valid analysis as some kind of like, oh, the symbolism of this curtain. And I don't think you got that, did you? Um, we got a little bit. I mean, I think we talked a little bit about that. I think my English teacher, especially in like the grade 11 and 12, which is when I really had a lot more vivid memory about, it was a lot more of a reading a piece of literature and understanding the context that it was written in and, you know, understanding where the author was coming from. So, like, you know, you know how we talked about before, how you said, I usually give context to everything. It's because everything requires some sort of context. If I read uh, To Kill a Mockingbird in today's viewpoint and today's standard, I would think it's the most, you know, if I, if I was looking at it only through the view of a 2020, 2022 person in today's world, I would imagine, without any context about what the world was prior to 10 years ago, I would think this is the most horrific, racist thing that I've ever read, right? But if I have the context of what era the person grew up in, I, I get a little better understanding of it. It gives me more um, humbleness about what 
we take for some things for granted today. And, and I think that's sort of what English class tries to bring about, especially in the later years. I think in the early part, it's very like, you read a bunch of Shakespeare stuff, you understand the context that it was both written in, and you understand the context of what everything is, what the symbolism means in certain circumstances. But then as you get into like grade 11, 12, you start reading more um, diverse books. Like I think my book I did for a, it was called an independent study unit. I did oh, a- little ISU, holy yes, crap. Yes, exactly. I don't know if anyone else had that. <laughs> um, I did a book on Dracula. I did the Dracula. So it was Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, based, I think it was like written like, I think 1910 or just before the 19, just before 1900s, I think I remember. Oh boy, I don't even remember. Yeah, so I did, so it was an ISU on it, right? So I read the book and I was like, okay, this is a cool book. Um, and, and we had to do, and the question, and our teacher gave us two options because she was very media focused. She was like, you can either do a full on report like anything else, or you can do a, a media presentation in front of the class to talk about, to do it in like sort of presentation form. Because the idea was like with English class, it's also, you know, she was trying to also emphasize like, hey, how about you try presenting your stuff in case, right? So she did bring up this one idea of doing a media thing about it. And I'm like, okay, well, Dracula's a very well-known character. Um, there was a movie back in the 1990s called Bram Stoker's Dracula. that starred Keanu Reeves, Winona Ryder. Sorry, not, she's not, sorry, why am I forgetting her name? She was from uh, Stranger Things, the mother from Stranger Things. I forget her the actress's name at the moment. Um, and it also starred uh, Anthony Hopkins as Van Helsing. And also Gary Oldman as Dracula. And I watched it. And I thought it was totally unrepresentative of the book <laughs> in, in most regards. I think they did a very good job of showing what Dracula actually looked like in the movie compared to every other villain, like when uh, Christopher Lee did it or when, um, oh, why am I forgetting, uh, Leslie Nielsen from the spoof one. I know you're giving me a blank look right now. But I'm, I know I sound very old, right? But trust me, I am, I'm a kind of younger guy. Um, <laughs> I watched that movie after I finished reading the book because like, hey, let me just see how the movie was. And then I watched the movie, and then that's when my presentation idea came in about how media has completely butchered the idea of Dracula, because it's basically now common property. Like, I don't know if you know what that... Um, oh, it, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a common IP, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's actually something I really, really enjoy talking about for whatever reason, right? Maybe it's because of this, the, the kind of, like, stories and media that I kind of get myself into, but... The one thing that got me throughout high school that made me sound super smart in English class was the idea of tropes and, like, archetypes, mm -hmm. right? So everyone, like, if you haven't heard of the term, everyone's definitely come across them, right? It's just these, like, really common reoccurring kinds of characters that because they follow this, like, specific type, they're, like, they, they have characteristics and stuff that you can usually predict, right? So, like, there's, like, the Romeo and Juliet tropes where, you know, there's, like, the star cross covers and stuff like that. There's, like, the really big bad guy, the big villain at the end. He's supposed to be, like, super evil and unredeemable and stuff like that, too. Uh, but the really interesting part is when a lot of these were developed, they are, as Zach mentioned, right, they're, they're a reflection of the culture at the time that, like, that became popular. And honestly, this turns into, like, meme formats a little bit, too, in, in like, modern day. But basically, right, when you can subvert expectations of these different archetypes, right, it makes you sound super smart. It's like, well, there's like this like cross star lovers and stuff, but with a twist. Okay, there, Ryan Johnson. I'll, <laughs> we'll talk about during the movie movie episode. But yes, continue. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's something that like again, it's it, it sort of all circles back. You know, we go on tangents, but we come back, I guess. Where everyone kind of has a little bit of context, and everyone has some kind of things that they've encountered, right? And so sharing that opinion honestly isn't so bad. You know, it's just having the confidence to do so. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the idea of, um, I'll go back to Dracula, because that's the presentation I worked on. <clears throat> so Dracula, as I said, it was at the end of the Victorian era. I think it was when it was written by Ram Stoker. And you can see a lot of that in the book, where the heroes, so to speak, like I think, I forget what the character's name was. I'll call, I'll call it by the actor's name, Keanu Reeves. So in, in the movie, Keanu Reeves, he is a very upstanding gentleman. You know, he's... Um, making the good money with his family business. Um, he meets a new, the new girl who was the uh, Winona. I forget what her last name is, but I'm going to call her Winona. Uh, Winona. And, you know, they're, they're set to get married and, you know, have a very generic family, right? It's only when Dracula gets introduced that he starts seducing her. He starts talking, that he starts, you know, putting bad thoughts into, into her mind. And then when he, when Keanu Reeves goes and visits Dracula, then he gets tantalized by, his, uh, by Dracula's wives. Who are you know all being all sexy and seductive, right? And that was very un, 
be un, be a heard of for women of the time period. The whole time period was like, if you show an ankle, you're a whore. If you, you know, if you um, even think about um, dating a guy without having permission from the family or without having the whole town know about it beforehand, it was very unheard of, you know, to have, you know, while there was probably secret relationships, it was, if you eventually got found out, you were considered a harlot. So that whole book where, you, you know, the reason why we see Dracula as being this suave, young, you know, young, relatively younger guy compared to what he's supposed to be and how all his wives are all supposed to be sexy women who are under his command, it's because at the time period that was considered a, ta a taboo topic. So it's the same thing with um, 101 Dalmatians, where I started to see that more and more. Where all of a sudden Cruella went from a villain in the time period, but now we see her today and everyone's considering her a hero, which I also kind of, I kind of slightly disagree with. Um, I think she has very powering traits, but for the time period that 101 Dalmatians was released, which I think was like the 1960s, the original one, right? I want to say 60s or 70s. Yeah, honestly, uh, everything in that time period is a blur. I live under a rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the same time period as like, you know, when Snow White and Beauty and the Beast came out, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can tell that it was an older time period because if you watch the movie, they're smoking like, uh, they're smoking pipes and they're we're driving like old-timey cars, right? So you see her and you hear a couple lines from her and you think like, wow, that's pretty empowering today. But you also have to remember that she's skinning and killing puppies, <laughs> So there's only so far you can Ooh. redeem someone. <laughs> yeah. So like that's where the context sort of comes from. I think English class kind of brings a lot of that into focus um, with a lot of the time, periodic time pieces. As well as the fact that, you know, with your English teacher, assuming they're a good English teacher, they're going to open your mind to different ideas and topics. And when they have that discussion, they, you know, some of the vivid discussions they have is when everyone reads a chapter and then the teacher just stands up and says, what are we going to talk about? And it just goes on a whole class talking about that. See, I, I wish more people got something like that because for me... Even, even for me, right? Like, it varied a lot for sure, right? I've definitely had an English teacher or two who, you know, everyone, you know, read this chapter or read this actor scene or whatever out of, like, Shakespeare or whatever. And, and then instead of trying to open discussion for what, like, the, the students thought about it, uh, it was a lot of stand in front of the class and tell you what you should have thought about it. You know, what is this yeah, symbol? No, what is that symbol? What does this mean? Why was this person here, you know? E exactly, right? And I think there was some of that in the earlier parts. And that's why I talked about, like, you know, how in grade nine and ten you get all these easy books where the symbolism and the ideology is very cut and paste up front in your face and you don't have they like, you know if you say the opposite it's like well i look at you funny right but then you go to a book like um i said bram stoker you go to um a book i think it was called the uh i think it was called like the chrysalids there's one it was a canadian book oh that sounds really familiar yeah yeah it's about mutants and such like you didn't. Oh, you didn't. Okay. You, you, I have definitely. Yeah, yeah. You didn't realize it was about. Yeah, you didn't realize it was about mutants at the beginning, and then and then as you read on, I'm like, whoa, wait a second, that's what happened. Like same thing with like um, handmade handmade tale, right? And same thing with um, do you remember the book? Uh, I think it was called the Kite Runner. Oh, the Kite Runner. Yeah, that was a bit, that was a really big that was a really fan, uh, popular book as well in English class, at least in our schools, um, where it's just like you gotta wonder um. I mean, you have this idea of who the villains and who the bad people are, but there's also other s small subjective ones that you have you to kind of... You win the to. tropes, right? You start hearing some things about someone, this one is the villain because exactly. of these tropes. Exactly. How many times have you heard the... You know, how many times after uh, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back do you start getting the whole I am your father spiel, right? How many times after... Um, I'm trying to think of another big trope. Um... I'm going to reference Empire Strike Back again when Han Solo, when Leia says, I love you, and Han Solo doesn't say, I love you back. He says, I know. How many times do you get the cocky, um, the, the cocky cowboy, you know, quote unquote yeah, space yeah. cowboy, I guess in Han Solo case, um, who, you know, is clearly he's like, he likes the female lead, but he's not going to say it. <laughs> you know, he wants to still perceive that. Um, or how many times do you get the, um, you now get the empath empathetic villain, like in Terminator 2? Yeah, right? yeah. Like, it's, it's a really interesting thing, right? Again, like, the idea of, like, tropes and how, like, everyone has encountered these in one way or another, but, like, if you don't actively think about it, you don't realize what's actually going on. And having your, like, uh, opinions and thoughts kind of based around expectations of, like, the characters in this case uh, is very similar to just having your opinions on just stuff, right? And so if I can sit here and talk with Zach about, you know, all these different characters and all these different mm -hmm. books and stuff, then... Mm -hmm. It can be the same thing for, like, even, like, world news and things like that. You know, you have lived on this planet for some number of years. Some of us a little longer than others, maybe. But uh, throughout that time, you've definitely had, like, your own encounters with stuff. And so having 
uh, your takes on these expectations that you've gotten throughout your years is, isn't the worst thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. You always want to, like, expand a little bit. Like, I always get um, annoyed when someone... I mean, I do it sometimes as well, where I'm like, oh, I don't want to go that far out, right? But it's more um, being open to different ideas. And I think, especially in Canada at least, um, I've definitely been in parts of the States where it's very uniform. Um, whereas in Canada, at least in our part of Canada anyway, it's very diverse. You get a bunch of different ideas. A little more liberal for my taste, but <laughs> you know, that's another topic for another time. Oh, boy. Yeah. We're, we're not going to delve into the politics quite yet. But no. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I I personally really enjoyed English class, right? And again, throughout that is how I shaped all these different like opinions of things. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I guess um, I'm trying to think of anything for English class because I mean I think we kind of covered most of that. Like we talked about the tropes, we talked about what English class has to offer. Um, I'm ho I mean I haven't been in high school in a long time, and I think especially because uh, we both came from a university background, we didn't really have to take any sort of those English classes in university. So so the funny thing is like um. Back in the day, all right, I was like, just like with everyone else, you know, I'm going to be a doctor. Anyone who wanted to go into some kind of like life science, biomedical science, any of that, right? Most of the time, it's just because you wanted to use it as a stepping stone to get into medical school. And I heard this from a lot of other students as well, where they would complain about needing to take English class in university because, oh, yeah. you know, why, why is English a mandatory subject to apply to most medical schools? And also, um, I'll add on this before uh, Calvin goes on his little, little rant, is that um, I think most computer science people have to take a communications class, not even English class, a communications class. So that tells you what the stereotypical engineer has to offer in terms of uh, literacy <laughs> and communication skills. Oh if, that, if, if a third or fourth year, I think it was last time I heard, person who can code the hell out of anything and can you know basically tell you what sort of algorithms are being done in all a lot of different websites can't properly present their ideas and has to take a full on course for it tells you just about how um fundamental some of the english principle or at least any sort of like talking your um ideas and subject in a reasonable manner in the language that you pr pr predominantly speak in is completely invaluable to, like, whatever profession you go with. So, yeah, sorry, continue on, Calvin. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, I mean, the thing is, like, it's it's an interesting skill, believe it or not, right? The things that, like, you are supposed to get out of English class, uh, again, seeing a bit more about, like, different cultures and stuff, trying to, you know, uh, be able to share your opinion and communicate and all that. And honestly, that's something reasonably good. You know, maybe our doctor should have that. Right. So I ended up actually taking a couple of English courses in university, and uh, it was uh, a little bit of like a different experience, I guess, because from what I was used to, right, because I had some really, really good English teachers that uh, really taught me how to like dissect a story and everything into its parts, how to subvert expectations. What are the expectations? Like, what are, what are these different interesting things about why we look at these different novels and stuff? And it truly turned into, because, you know, the lecture system, uh, the, the professor just going like, wow, that book was amazing. Here is all the stuff that like you should have picked up and any other opinion is wrong. And I'm like, well, that's, that's not quite what we expected, right? Yeah, like there's, there's some nuance to that, right? Like there's, I'll keep using Dracula as an example. Um, if I take out a Dracula that all females who present themselves in a sexually attractive way towards any sort of their part, to any partners that they want, is a harlot or whore and, you know, has bad intentions, I think it's just ridiculous, right? And that's the very far out one. Now, m saying that, I guess, in Dracula's case, um, that th from the time period that it came from, it, they were they perceived that way? Yes, that is an okay opinion to take. But just saying it outright, that all women because of that, because of what this book shows, that's the case? Like, no, that's, that's incredibly um, disrespectful to what the author had in mind. So... The author probably did have in mind via different interviews, via different uh, talks and such that they said, here is what my book wanted to be about, right? And you can have an idea about it. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means, okay, that's your idea. How do you justify that? And how much loops and jumping over the point do you need to get to to get to that conclusion? Because... Um, I'm trying to think of another example. Like, the, uh, hopefully, everyone kind of understands my, where I'm getting from. Is where how many hoops do I have to jump through to get to that conclusion? 
And if I have to jump through a lot of different hoops, then yes, it's probably not a very good take. And it's probably, and maybe there is some um, understanding about, yeah, that opinion is sort of wrong, right? But I think you just need to elaborate on it more. And the best way to, un to understand whether a take or an opinion is, is right or wrong or even has like some idea of critical thinking applied behind it is just to ask about it, saying, okay, well, can you explain that to me further? And if they can explain it to you further, then basically they've just taken a surface level take on it and that's it. And then if you start to dissect it, then that's where it becomes uh, problematic or becomes a issue, a question of, well, did you actually think hard about this before you said it <laughs> out loud? <laughs> and I've never taken an uh, English course in university, so I don't, I don't know about that. But it sounds like if that's the case, then oh my god, I'm glad I missed that bullet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it was such a jarring experience for me because, like, it was so odd. Having said that, though, I mean, the lecture system isn't great for this, right? No. Because, like, if... If you're in a classroom that is, what, like 100, 200 kids, all, like most of them are actually mandatorily taking this because they want to go to medical school and not actually out of interest, um, they, they just kind of like sit there and listen to like the guy standing at the podium kind of going like, hey, this is, you know, what, what you are supposed to read. This is what you are supposed to encounter. And uh, it, it was hard to have a back and forth with so many people with like one podium at the front, right? And they tried to like change that a little bit in like the, the smaller like tutorial settings and maybe mm -hmm. just fall short on anyone who hasn't been to university and maybe we'll talk more about the university experience another time. But uh, in a tutorial, you end up with a smaller amount of people and like, I don't know, like 20-ish, 15-ish. Yeah, and, you, and that's also dependent on the course that you take because sometimes I think for your, a lot of your grad courses, they are around 15 or 20 people, I imagine. Or they, yeah, whereas if you're in the general, what's called the undergraduate program, which is basically the base level that I would say close to 90 to 85% of people actually take um, before they move out into the real world. Like their lecture halls can be up to 100 to 50, 50 to 100 people, depending on the program that you're in. And the tutorials will be around 20 or so. And that's really the small ones. And then there's also, depending on the course that you take, we took a lot of science courses, they'll have labs as well. But that's the general idea is where you have, where you're not talking with a prof directly in that tutorial, you're talking with their grad students, instructional interns, where whoever the case may be, who are supposed to represent what the prof was trying to bring forth in their lectures. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, again, the unfortunate part about education is a lot of the times it depends on who runs it, right? So the, the tutorials yeah. were a little bit better, right? Smaller classes, so it was a little bit easier to have a bit of a back and forth. But any time that I raised, like, a, a different viewpoint, not even a different opinion, just, you know, I want to look at it from this lens of, like, I want to talk about characters, how the characters contribute to the story, whether it's good or bad, right? Yeah. Just like how I did in high school, you know? Because, again, the idea of you, you experience some kind of narrative, some kind of whatever, and you want to talk about why you enjoyed it, right? Because that's perfectly valid. So I'll, get, I'll give you one other example, and also I think we're reaching the, I think we're reaching the 40-minute mark at this point, right? Yeah, yeah okay. we can keep going. Oh, we can keep going? Okay, so yeah, we'll keep going. Keep going. So um, what I was going to mention was um, I didn't take any English classes, but I did take a geography class because it was mandatory for engineers. Um, it was like the first year geography course. It when, wasn't mandatory for me. No, no, it was a mandatory elective. Like You had, ah, you had to right, take an elective, right, right, right. and it had to be from a non-engineer or non-science field. Right, and because so, engineers also have depth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and listen, I actually got lucky because I took management, so I took a bunch of business courses as well. So I, only, I got even luckier where I only had to take like one, one uh, extra elective, quote, so to speak. And I took a geography course because I heard it was a burn course. You literally, for your exam, you had to draw on a map of the world. It was funny. So there was a tutorial one time, and we we're talking about like different geopolitics and such. And it was kind of interesting. And because at the time we were talking about the uh, Via Rail, or sorry, the, the, the light LRT, the LRT rail that they're trying to oh, build yeah. um, in southern Ontario. So... And then we started going on the topic about uh, government control and such. I don't know, I can't remember exactly. And I remember, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to be thoughtful. I'm going to be critical thinking. I'm going to bring up this point. And it was a point that I heard one time when I was watching a documentary about the previous prime minister, not the current Trudeau, not Justin Trudeau, his father, Pierre Trudeau from the 1980s, who was basically like you want to say the equivalent of a celebrity, right? Yeah. And as much as people may or may not give him flack, I don't know much about it. I think I heard this one comment that he wrote in saying that the government has no place in the bedroom of the citizen. Oh, yeah, the famous quote. Yes, yeah, so that was a famous quote. And I, that kind of stuck with me. And now you can interpret that as whichever way you want, right? Which and is so why I want to, a famous quote. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to bring it up in the um, this context in what the discussion was. And I brought up that quote. And then everyone just kind of looked at me. And then the TA, or the teaching assistant at the time, kind of just said, well, what if something happens to your house that's illegal and you want the cops to get in? Does the government have an opportunity like that? I'm like, 
and I didn't want to go into debate with her because I, that would have been into a much more um, ethical and question of government power in that sense. So I just kind of left it at that. And uh, but I was just thinking, like from her mindset, she was just thinking of if someone does something legal, they should have the everyone should have the right to barge into your house and do it. Oh boy, and that is that is a can of worms too. Exactly right. So I just thought, like, okay, you're kind of closing your mind to one sense, and that's probably because what she wanted at the time and what she, her ide- values and ideas were is that the government is probably the one stuff that helps me the best. But you have to take it from a more nuanced perspective where it's like, okay, well, do I want the government in my life all the time or do I want them in some of the time? Like, that, that's the question, right? And, and we're not going to talk about it now, but I wanted to give you that idea of where you're talking about TAs and having, like, and lecturers having um, very direct opinions and stances on things and yeah, not moving yeah. past that is, like, I saw that, like, you know, just the TA, or sometimes even tutorials and such, like, have that issue. Um, it's not always, you, it really just depends on the person you get. It's really just a uh, lottery, so to speak, when you get yeah, to get into certain, certain oh, courses. Man. I So I, I had that English class, right? And in that tutorial, I was the problem kid because, like, unlike you, when, like, I brought up an opinion and I, like, you didn't want to go further, I did. I was oh. like, this is, this. I'm going in. Like, I don't care, man. You right? were the guy that everyone, <laughs> everyone either hated because they're like, get on with the content I need to know for the whatever exam or report. Or some people were like, great, I'm going to sleep or I'm going to watch the soccer game on my laptop, <laughs> oh, <laughs> laptop yeah. during that class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I went in. I was like, this, this isn't, this is like, I want to share my opinion. All right. There's, there's more nuance to this discussion rather than just this person is bad. This person is racist. And it's like, well, yes, but no. Yes, in the sense that they probably shouldn't be saying that. But in, again, in the eyes of whatever it was back then and context of what we have now and all, all that junk and I, I legitimately would sit there and debate with this TA for like 10 minutes and like you would expect like oh you know I'm you know worried about my grade or anything like I didn't care at the time I just I gave up on medical school halfway through taking that course so I just went like I would just share my university opinion. beat him down <laughs> into the cow we know today the slacker <laughs> oh man no no but yeah I think I think that kind of like sums up a lot of like our experiences with like some courses teaching instruction and opinions right yeah i think so i mean i mean we'll go into a little more in depth about engineering school in general and then a later one but we started this podcast we started this uh talk about what po- this podcast would be like and now we're on english and and university stuff so that's going to give you everyone a relative idea of how this podcast is going to go um i'm trying to think if there's anything else we want to talk about the podcast about what we want the podcast to be like i really think like this is kind of what i want it to be um more or less and i'm hoping that whoever whatever third party comes in can can jive with us as the cool cats would say <laughs> oh man oh boy yeah i mean that's that's a lot of it right like it's it's a, it's the idea of just sitting here with like a good friend and kind of like talking about opinions and thoughts and stuff because sometimes you just kind of want to talk about stuff you know and like that's honestly sometimes more helpful than whatever direct advice you're trying to ask for well sometimes people just don't have the uh sorry i'm burping more um <laughs> um i think it's always good to have different opinions from different people, but you got to, but you know, it's not like we're, we're okay, I guess I'll, here's what I'll say as well. We're not sending these messages and not giving this advice to people who are very young and impressionable. That's the main thing. We're not teachers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not teachers. Even then some teachers are even, we can be better teachers than they are. <laughs> um, and we're not, you know, saying like, Hey, this is the certain advice that you need to go and do now. Right. We're just giving our, our opinions, our takes, and we're seeing if people actually like that. And if people do like that, then hopefully it'll show in the views and everything like that. And in that sort of idea, hopefully the YouTube algorithm will be kind to us <laughs> in this case. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, we're just, you know, saying what we want. And if anyone comes back to us, I, I've heard, so I've heard this um, one as well, um, where if you're a celebrity, especially if you're a very high-end celebrity, right? Like, you know, I'm talking about like you, whether it's a Kanye, Kardashian, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio type, right? Sure. Where... Some people say you need to have a certain respect and quote unquote nobility to that role because some people may actually take what you say for, for very close, close to, to, to heart, right? And to that, I, I say yes and no. I say if it's you, like with everything, yes exactly. No. Everything is always a yes and no question. It's not, it's not black or white, it's always gray. Um, it's always about whether. A, you, you want that celebrity to be truthful because that's how you get people to like you, right? You want to be down, somewhat down to earth like Jennifer Lawrence and other celebrities who have created that sort of image around them. But you also want them to have a certain understanding like, hey, I'm of a very high figurative role. 
And people actually look at me and, for whatever reason, take what I say for, to heart, right? I should maybe wa moderate what I say oh, just a little bit, just a little bit, right? Um, it doesn't mean you want to always moderate everything where you basically become a drone or you become like an NPC, I'll, I'll say. Um, but you also want to share your opinion every once in a while, right? You say, hey, maybe I don't like this, maybe I do like this, right? But don't become, like, I think that people who are in those roles and all of a sudden become quote unquote advocates for things, I think are kind of taking it a little bit step too far. Like you're kind of going out of left field a bit. It's the same idea where you see, um, there was a, so I'm gonna reference another YouTuber here, internet historian, right? So um, there was a video he released called Costa Concordia. I highly recommend anyone who's listening to this watch go and watch it right now. It's like a 40 minute long quote unquote troll slash very um, in-depth story about the probably second largest cruise ship disaster happened since the Titanic, if not the most. Um, and there's a woman on there who took her fame and basically used it for political advocate reasons. And I think that's just kind of disingenuous. Like, if you're only caring about certain things because you want the attention and you want to still be in the quote-unquote spotlight, and I think, no, you, you're given this role, you're on platform, you're on this platform, you're on TV, whatever media you're on, and you're doing that for one specific reason, which is that you're going to be on trial. <laughs> <laughs> that was the reason why she was getting all this publicity. And then later on, he expands onto that. She, the, what she's been doing now is she's been doing more political activist stuff, w using her celebrity to bring this to attention, which I think is, sure, it's okay, but, I mean, that's, just remember, that's your own ideals, right? Like, yeah, you should, like, um, this is a very Canadian thing. So, um, Calvin, have you ever seen the Sarah McLaughlin uh, um, ads on TV that run at, like, 8 in the morning on weekends? What? I, I don't have a TV, Zach. <laughs> well, when you, when you were a kid. When you were a kid, did you ever watch that? God, and they, and they, and they so. always played the song, In the Arms of an Angel. For some reason, I feel like I, I missed a part of Canadian history, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so Sarah McLaughlin is a famous uh, Canadian, I want to say, quote-unquote, country singer. Never really listened to much of her music. She did a, uh, she did a couple of, like stuff with um, some other artists, right? But I think she was more, quote-unquote, a Canadian country singer, right? And for a long time, she did a lot of SPCA, like, you know, the Social Pet uh, Central sure. Association. Basically, like, Adopt dogs, adopt adopt cats, and they she always ran these commercials on online, right? On on the ads, and it's not like, and you know she's promoting it, right? But it she's not. But whenever you talk, see her in her, her like major interviews and such, she's not like bringing it to the forefront every single time. It's like if she asks for it, I think um, she'll um, talk about it. But it's not like she's becoming a uh, irritating activist, so to speak, about it. So, but you, but she did run those ads. She was something she supported and wanted to help out with. I think she did that, and I think she also did for um, at the time the kids in like the the African countries, I think it was so like stuff like like you know a dollar a day and help get this child. Um, oh, that food. sounds more familiar though. Yeah, that might be the one I'm thinking about right now. And she was the one I was advocate, but I think she was more in the pet side because I remember it was always her playing that song, and it was like the cutest dog in like the shelter. Oh my getting, god! Getting like te tearing on your heartstrings, being like, "Let me adopt them right now." Um. So, you know, that's the idea of what, uh, I guess, what we're trying to get at is like, you know, when we used to talk about this sort of stuff, and we talked, and, you know, I'm going to call it whether we're calling shit, talk about shit or not, <laughs> um, it's a question of, do you think that our opinion is valid or not? And that's not for us to decide. We're just another random podcast of the thousands of podcasts on there that are taking, somewhat taking it for granted, like, um that, you know, sometimes you can take their advice for granted or sometimes you can say, yeah, maybe their advice is actually good, but you got to apply your own critical thinking. And if you're, and if people aren't okay with doing that, then that is their decision to make. <laughs> oh boy, that is an interesting point to end on. But yeah, I think that's all we have for this week. Yes. Now remember, please like, comment, and subscribe. We do really need it. Calvin is like living off of ramens and, uh, <laughs> and government paychecks. He really needs your help. <laughs> oh my God.